As I said, my name is Dave Grisanti. I am a principal engineer at the New York Times, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, our developer platform, but uh, a little bit about the technical side and also a little bit about platform as product, so how we're, how we're sort of crossing the chasm. Um, just uh, another intro slide, I already did this. Um, so let me tell a little bit about the Times. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the New York Times. Uh, but our mission is simple. We seek the truth and help people understand the world. And we're doing that by building the essential subscription bundle for every curious person who seeks to understand and engage with the world. And for most people, they're probably you know, most familiar with our news product, with uh, our journalism. But in the last you know, 10 years, the company has really um, expanded on its uh, digital footprint. You know, we've got a lot of games after the acquisition of Wordle. Uh, they've always had the crossword, a lot of new games, strands. Um, connections, we have more coming out. Um, cooking has a very big presence for people who are um, chefs. Uh, we have a lot of uh, interesting recipes. Uh, Wirecutter has been a Times property since 2016. And then The Athletic is a newer acquisition that's a sports journalism uh, paper that was acquired a few years ago. So all of this sort of makes up this bundle that we're trying to build um, and sort of lean into our digital presence. And in, in reality, we're a very digital first experience at this point. Obviously, we still print a paper. But stories like this are um, you know, told through, this, through um, interactives, you know, with this combination of text and video and pictures, you know, all overlaid, in this case, over something like Google Earth. And really what uh, our goal is in the platform engineering team that I'm on is to give our newsroom uh, the tools that they need and just the freedom to build things like this without having to worry about the traditional DevOps and you know, operation side of, um, of deploying these things in a, in a production environment. Uh, so today I'm going to talk through um, uh, the set of things, so sort of go over our internal developer platform, uh, talk a little bit about the architecture and how we deal with onboarding, and then the second half I'm going to talk about platform as product and also how we're sort of dealing with crossing the chasm, getting our internal users sort of onto our platform um, you know, without necessarily needing mandates, and then wrap up with lessons learned. So uh, what is an IDP? Uh, so an internal developer portal is a, you know, a centralized platform designed to improve the productivity and experience of development teams within an organization. And you know, so we sort of think about this thing in, in a few ways, um, you know, a set of self-service infrastructure, um, service catalog, uh, documentation, and also tooling and automation. And in our case, this is made up of a few different components uh, that different teams are responsible for. But we're sort of empowering teams uh, to have all these capabilities without having to worry about you know, who's building them and um, maintaining them themselves. So at the, the time specifically, um, we have the New York Times shared platform. Uh, it's designed to create that you know, a set of tools to provide those capabilities I mentioned that any developer at the Times can work on, whether they're building a game or you know, uh, providing our publishing platform uh, or you know, producing recipes. Uh, and this aligns with our uh, enterprise goal of using technology and data to propel our growth. So, to think about you know, the day-to-day -day life of a developer, you know, they really want to focus on developing their application, uh, you know, writing code, uh, writing business logic, and, and shipping their app. But in most cases, we've sort of burdened them down lately with you know, sort of shifting a lot of things left and making a lot of things their responsibility, which um, you know, increases their workload. So whether that's th th things like containerization or how to provision their app, uh, how to build and test and deploy it, uh, even if we're giving them the tools in many cases, they're still uh, burdened by learning how to use the tool, how to write the logic around it. There's not a lot of um, templates provided out of the box. Uh, how to deal with routing, so ingress logic, you know, providing some sort of DDoS or WAF, um, and also monitoring, observability, metrics, that sort of thing. So these are all sort of things we saw people worrying about and sort of doing in slightly different ways that we wanted to consolidate down into a set of paved paths. So in our case, we sort of thought about how do we you know, provide that uh, to our users and engineers so that they have sort of a more seamless experience? So we, um, I'm going to show sort of a component level diagram of what our platform looks like. Uh, so in, on the left, we have like sort of a create onboard step. This is where users would come when they're first entering the platform, regardless if it's a new app or a migration. And we have sort of a source control um, uh, repository, a uh, set of CI CD uh, pipelines that's spread across a few tools. Uh, uh, Runtime, that's based on Kubernetes. I'll talk about that a little later. Um, uh, cloud accounts, 
and then an ingress layer to deal with, um, deal with routing. And then all that's sort of uh, overlaid by a set of observability tooling, uh, whether it's things built into the templates that we're providing teams or the tooling that where we ship all the data for them to visualize things. Um, there's also, at the moment, sort of a IDP platform uh, UI being built. It's not in the picture since it's still pretty early, but we are sort of still exploring that as well, of you know, how could that can enable developers to have a more seamless experience without needing to deal with CLIs or you know, multiple different UIs. So let me talk next about a little bit about architecture and onboarding. Um, so from the runtime perspective, um, our cloud accounts, cloud architecture, are, is set up so that each team has their own account. Uh, and this sort of allows teams to have the flexibility so to not step on each other's toes. Um, it gives us a good way to kind of track cost across teams and um, so, you know, limits the scope of, um, of impact of adverse events. Um, and it gives them, the, like, in their development environment, sort of have some freedom to, to play around in a, in a, uh, in a dev account uh, without affecting other teams. So cloud setup is sort of you know, by team. Uh, then when it comes to the Kubernetes runtime, we sort of have this, you know, this dilemma, which I'm sure many of you have faced if you're in this situation of, do we run you know, these multi-single tenant clusters for teams or groups of teams, or do we run like one big multi-tenant cluster maybe by environment? So like a, a dev stage prod for everybody. And in this case, you know, it's a, it uses a series of trade-offs. Uh, you know, on one hand, having separate clusters for each team can provide more control and isolation, similar to with the cloud accounts, uh, allowing them to customize things. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, so it's sort of easier to optimize uh, multi-tenant clusters and you know, limit the scope of control, at least for the, the platform teams. It gives you a smaller um, amount of clusters to keep upgraded and um, security, security things to worry about. But you know, ultimately, the decision is down to your individual use case. I think for us, we sort of took these items into consideration. So like, what does network isolation look like? Um, how would we deal with role-based access control? Uh, you know, each team having their own tenant, it's easier to maybe control it and give a team full access. Maybe they even have admin access to their own cluster. But if it's multi-tenant, then we have to worry about um, you know, limiting that control. Um, operational agility, uh, uh, you know, how do we deal with security? And how do we deal with resource management, especially if everybody's in you know, one big cluster, at least you know, by, by region or so. Uh, so for us, uh, we decided to go with the multi-tenant approach. Uh, so in our case, we've got you know, clusters by environment. And then we have a few clusters in, in different regions for different environments. Um, but this, may, this sort of met our needs the best. Uh, and the way that we deal with the separate cloud accounts uh, and the single clusters is that we have automatic like routing rules that um, are provisioned anytime a new tenant is, is brought online uh, for each of these clusters. And to deal with the security sort of role-based access control, we don't give clients direct access uh, to the <clears throat> Kubernetes API to make any changes. Uh, so no one has you know, admin access. Uh, we have an operator that we built uh, that sort of lays over top of Kubernetes that deals with creating what we call a tenant. That gives them their own namespace or sub namespaces and creates policies uh, within the cluster to sort of limit their scope. So a team you know, is sort of bound by what's inside that namespace. Uh, and that's all automated for them. So whenever a new cloud account comes online, they sort of get the tenant and everything that comes along with it assigned to their team. Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about application templating. So this really deals with the onboarding. Uh, so our goal in the beginning when we started working on this was to uh, provide teams with a way of building a fully functional service that could be running in production in under 10 minutes, uh, which is a, a lofty goal. I think we are close to getting there. Uh, the only caveat to the 10-minute thing is there's still a manual security gate in place that our security team uh, has to you know, uh, manually review and check off to deal with getting access to those cloud accounts I mentioned. Um, we're working with them to figure out ways to you know, automate that a little more. But assuming that they do it during normal business hours and the security team is checking the pull requests we open, um, you know, they can get the environment up and running in dev within, a, you know, within an hour, and then you know, they have the ability to promote it to production immediately after that. Uh, so this templating engine that we worked on um, sort of has a set of included capabilities and then a set of things that the user uh, would provide. So in, in this case, we really want them to focus on the business logic and their application code, and then not have to worry about all the things that are on the left. So things that I mentioned in that earlier diagram. So um, the source control setup, even source code starter kits. So we have a few languages that we support where they get 
uh, a basic web app out of the box with uh, monitoring and secrets management built in. So the observability tooling is already there, secrets like I mentioned, uh, the containerization, so Docker files there, the build and test pipelines, the deploy pipelines, all their Kubernetes manifests, and routing configuration. So you know they come to a, uh, a form, they click a button, and they get all this uh, stuff out of the box for them. So all that's really just code that we're storing in GitHub. Um, the observability tooling is all done through OpenTelemetry. Uh, we're using Vault for secrets, uh, Docker, as I mentioned, containerization. Uh, the build and test pipelines uh, are done through a tool called Drone. And then we're using um, Argo CD for deployment. And then the Kubernetes manifests and routing configuration are a combination of uh, customize and, and Helm. Um, I could probably give a whole 10 minute talk about the customized Helm thing and how much we struggled with, uh, like with the balance of giving people the freedom to have some of this YAML in their repo and how much to abstract away. Uh, that's still sort of a, a journey in progress. Uh, but what we essentially did to limit what was being done in the repos is we made our own sort of New York Times platform Helm chart that encapsulates most, if not everything, that they need. And then they only deal with customizations using customize on top of that. Uh, so the way the workflow works is a team comes and fills out a form. This is sort of being moved to that portal I mentioned uh, at the moment, but traditionally it was just a Google form. Um, they would fill that out, give their team name, uh, what tenant they were going, toward, going to in the Kubernetes cluster, uh, a Slack channel, and a few other things about their team, uh, what, you know, what code um, language they wanted to use, click, you know, click go. Uh, that would create the repository in Git, um, kick off a pipeline uh, in Drone, and then Drone would sort of like do all the other stuff that was needed. So set up Vault, set up Argo, um, and then like actually create their source code repository for them, and then Argo would you know, deal with the deployment. Um, that gate I mentioned is somewhere in the Vault um, Argo piece uh, that has to be a check mark, but once that's done, uh, the deployment is sort of, uh, it will, you know, will automatically happen. Uh, so that's sort of the workflow, and I said it's, it's for new or existing app, you can run it against an existing repository. Uh, it'll skip sort of the source code piece and still give you all the build test pipelines and all the Kubernetes manifests that you need. So if we had a team coming from um, you know, some other runtime engine, whether it's in AWS or, or Google, you know, they could run this, get all that they need to run to our platform and sort of like delete their old stuff or have it deployed to both at the same time uh, since the you know, things could sort of coexist. Uh, from a continuous deliveries perspective, I mentioned we're sort of using um, uh, Argo CD primarily to deploy to Kubernetes. And the idea with this is we really wanted to focus on, on GitOps and uh, storing everything in Git that was uh, required to do the deployments to, to the Kubernetes interface. Um, and for folks who aren't familiar with, with GitOps, um, GitOps is an operational framework based on DevOps, uh, like continuous integration, continuous delivery. Um, you know, it automates infrastructure and manages uh, software deployments. So you know, it enables developers to sort of put what, the, what they want to be deployed in their runtime in Git, and then Argo deals with sort of syncing that. Uh, this was definitely a change from what the developers were used to. Uh, traditionally, they were using Drone to do, sort of do a push uh, to a Kubernetes environment or somewhere else you know, as, as their PRs were merged. Um, in, in the Argo case, and I'm not going to talk too much about this, but the you know, YAML that is deployed to Argo happens through our CI CD process, and Argo takes, takes over. Um, but it sort of prevents it from, from the environment from drifting. And if um, so, someone tries to go in and delete something, Argo will sort of resync it and keep things, uh, keeps the state managed correctly. And so we, you, don't, you don't have these cases where you're not sure what's running in production. You, know, you can just go back to your GitHub repo and look, and that's what should be running, because Argo's keeping it in sync. Uh, so in our goals were with this platform, and specifically with continuous delivery, were to, to centralize uh, software delivery so that teams weren't following lots of different patterns and using different tools. And this sort of paved the way for more advanced deployment capabilities. Uh, so think like blue-green or canary um, could be done you know, with a simple you know, YAML change uh, in Argo versus teams having to sort of write this complicated YAML syntax in drone, which each, with, with each team sort of doing it differently depending on their needs. Um, and this allowed us to offer predefined workflows and templates and best practices, uh, deal a little bit more with um, security around how, you know, how they're writing their pipelines. Uh, and adopt common workflows across teams. Uh, so next I want to shift gears a little bit uh, and talk about how we're approaching sort of building the platform at the company 
and how we've involved our product management team, um, and really making sure we're building like what users want and what users need. So for folks who aren't familiar with uh, platform as product, um, there's a quote that I put up there from uh, ThoughtWorks. This is um, from their uh, tech radar back in 2021. Uh, so from their perspective, they continue to see platform engineering uh, product teams as a sensible default, with the key insight being that they're just another product team, albeit one focused on internal platform customers. So I mean, the idea here is you know, you're really treating your internal users like any other customer, as if you were building a product that they were buying and you were sort of selling. You want to make sure you're building something that they want to use and uh, aren't sort of using because they're forced to. And this, I mean, for folks who aren't familiar with, you know, product management generally is sort of at the intersection of technology, business, and user needs. So sort of, you know, thinking about building this um, as something that people would buy, like I mentioned. So the timeline that we've sort of been uh, going for is back in 2021 uh, is when we started sort of the discovery phase um, <clears throat> of the platform. So we had this, um, not mandate, but sort of like a, a push from the business to say we want to do some centralization uh, within the company. You know, we have lots of drift between teams across different clouds, um, you know, different practices. You know, we'd like to see what some, some kind of centralization would look like uh, you know, in forming a platform team. Uh, so the idea here was you know, sort of mapping the opportunity space, conduct some user research across the tech org, understand what the current needs and pain points were of the engineers at the times, and then sort of you know, think about how we could synthesize that feedback uh, around the core domains of our infrastructure teams so we could see what larger patterns existed and where we needed maybe more centralization or where we needed less. Uh, so the you know, idea here was understanding where we can scale and leverage. Um, so this diagram sort of goes through the technology domains that we looked at, so CICD, observability, traffic and routing, runtime, and reliability. And these are similar to the, you know, the themes and the components I mentioned earlier. Um, so it's, you know, we definitely had discrepancies uh, in the user discovery. Certain people uh, wanted you know, sort of more centralization. Some people wanted less. Uh, so the idea was just like understanding the different personas at the company. We had some folks who were sort of interested in, you know, they liked doing some DevOps work maybe, so they maybe wanted less because they wanted more freedom to make some changes. And then other people who were um, not familiar with really an ops role at all, you know, maybe they were just front end developers and they were you know, sort of okay with more centralization because they wanted to focus on just building their app. Uh, so this kind of helped us map and get a sense of what the different personas were. Uh, next, we had enough information and we're like, okay, what does you know, sort of a, an MVP minimal viable product look like and how do we get it into users' hands and like, what's a good time? Uh, so we used uh, our Maker Week uh, hackathon uh, as an opportunity. So this is a once a year thing that the Times does in the summer. Uh, that the whole company sort of part um, gets involved in. And we knew that a lot of people were going to would be building new apps during Maker Week, because a lot of times they sort of set aside their day jobs and like start a new game or you know, try, to, try to build something new and they want to get it done quickly. Uh, so we got everything up and, up and running to uh, sort of offer this first iteration of our, of our tool. That was the templating tool that I showed, plus the CICD pipelines and also the, the runtime. Um, and this sort of gave us an, a way of validating our North Star uh, and enabling engineers to sort of start from scratch without having to figure out, like, you know, how do I deploy this? How do I get access to an AWS account? How do I go through all these steps uh, when I want to just get started and sort of hack during the week? Uh, and we also, also incentivized feedback at the end of the week uh, for, um, with a survey that we sent out and we offered some gift cards, just something nominal, but just a way to get people sort of involved and like make sure we got feedback at the end of the week and they didn't just go back to work and forget about telling us how they felt. Uh, so after we launched the MVP, uh, about a year, our target was sort of six to eight months later to sort of be at a point where we could uh, be at GA, which is you know, not that everybody in the company would be using it, but anybody could use it if they wanted to. Uh, and we sort of knew that the whole company wasn't gonna come running. There was a lot of people that were running very large apps on you know, totally different environments that they wouldn't be ready to move over. But the idea is, you know, how do we sort of get from uh, where we are to GA by sometime in 2023? Um, so, uh, you know, so as we were doing this, we were sort of thinking about um, what are the different, you know, types of users we have. And I think in the beginning, we were sort of uh, realizing that we have these sort of early adopters. And this, you know, this curve up here shows uh, the diffusion of innovation theory. It explains how over time an idea or a product 
gains momentum and diffuses or spreads throughout a specific population or an organization. So really, from the product perspective, <clears throat> you're trying to think where in the organization are the innovators and early adopters, and how do we get them excited early, because they'll be, they'll be more willing to engage with us. So we you know, looked at the folks who were engaging with our MVP and who sort of had positive feedback and tried to build a coalition of them to get them excited, make sure we have somebody sort of from, from each organization or each team sort of that we could tap and say, you know, what's the, what's the vibe like in your team for our platform? Are people liking it? Are they happy with it? You know, what could we change? And don't try to, you know, build everyone's features all at once. Um, so the idea is sort of like, how do we make the platform compelling? You know, in many, many ways, our internal platform was competing with serverless, no YAML solutions offered by cloud providers. You know, how do we offer values that, or value that users can't easily find elsewhere? Something that's unique to their needs at the times. And are there a small set of capabilities that sort of will create, create excitement? Uh, and like regularly listen to users, do feedback sessions with them, whether it's synchronous or async, just give them a way to have a clear line of communication. Uh, and so as our platform supported more and more users and we're building this, doing the GA, we really need to figure out how to manage the sprawl of feedback. Uh, so feedback was coming from everywhere, Slack, um, email, et cetera, and we had to figure out like how do we synthesize all this? Uh, and so it's transparent for everybody in the platform team to see and visualize. So what we uh, used and what this center picture shows is this idea of a rainbow spreadsheet. Uh, so it's a simple method for visualizing, identifying, visualizing, identifying strong versus weak themes in qualitative data. So the idea is you sort of, um, you know, build a, a color per team, and have like sort of themes on the left. And then if each of these teams uh, said something that sort of maps back to this, you color code it, and it sort of gives you a way to say like, oh well, you know, th these um, these rows, obviously every team had this problem, or only one team had. So you can sort of um, get a, a sense quantitatively of um, you know, what problems might exist. Uh, we also came up with this maturity model. I'm not gonna read all of this, but this sort of mimics Google's, which is this idea of having different phases that uh, um, the product itself and also maybe new features would go through. We had an issue where people were calling things different, beta, alpha, so we sort of tried to standardize on, okay, let's have a POC phase, uh, experimental, dev preview, GA, and that way, there's clear expectations from the user side and also internally, you know, what we're providing as the things move through these phases. Uh, and lastly, uh, sort of, sort of where we at now, uh, which is you know, kind of crossing the, the chasm of early adopters to early majority um, in 2024. So going back to the diffusion uh, of innovation diagram, you know, the the point where you're going to hit the the biggest issue, the point of greatest peril. Uh, is really jumping from early adopter to early majority. Um, you know, when you start the adoption journey, you really have these people that are excited. They might want to try new technology, uh, might be interested in giving you feedback. Uh, but in reality, you really have to win over even the pessimists. So, like, you know, taking a step back and asking everyone what they think. You know, what what do they see that the pl the platform might need, or what features do they need to really get everyone to sort of get on board. And you really have to think about a shift in strategy and marketing. Um, you know, what you did for the early adopters may not you know, work for everybody else. Um, highlight user success stories. Um, and think of how you can scale confidence and trust in the platform. And then with that, let me just wrap up with a few lessons learned, since I only have a minute left. Uh, so business and culture have a big impact on architecture. So make sure you're rooting early architecture decisions within the context of your company's business needs. Platform as product is not you know, just about the technology. It's really about building and evolving the, the tools that you're building. The focus should be on the users and the business. And what worked well uh, during your early adoption phase may not work when you're scaling out to the majority of users. So consider shifting your marketing strategy and investments to help scale confidence and trust in the platform. And with that, I will wrap up. Uh, 30 seconds. We've probably got time for one or two questions. So if anyone has a question for David, there are microphones standing up in the middle there. So please head to a microphone and ask Hi. a question. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was really good. 
Um, I wanted to ask, like you mentioned, that you configure like different accounts on cloud providers for developers. So, what level of expertise is like you know expected of them? Are they still expected to create and manage these cloud resources on their own, or do you have some automation for that as well? Um, <clears throat> so, for the specific cloud accounts that we give the teams, that's really intended for sort of experimentation, and then anything that they need or want to build that wouldn't run in Kubernetes. So uh, in our case, that might be like managed databases, uh, maybe like SNS, SQS, things like that. Um, so there is a little bit of expertise needed to sort of understand if your application needs one of those things. We do offer um, sort of uh, you know, out of the box Terraform modules that people can use to build those things um, if they want to go that route. Many of them are already sort of open source and public. We're not doing I mean, that's super special. Uh, but that, that piece is still all managed sort of with our tooling, but outside of the Kubernetes runtime. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Uh, one of the biggest questions that I have when we're trying to adopt one of these platforms is how do we keep the platform from not just being another thing that we have to support on top of everything that exists already? Uh, yeah, I think for us, we're I mean, still learning some of those lessons. We haven't built too many complex abstractions on top of the platform, which I think is good and bad. So it means that we don't have a ton of stuff to maintain that's not the core components, like the CICD tool and the runtime. But it does mean that we're exposing a lot of the complexity in some ways directly to the users, um, which I think requires upskilling and training and everything. And I, I think we're sort of slowly figuring out what abstractions need to be built uh, with the understanding that that's going to add you know, complexity and also um, some more stuff for us to maintain, uh, whether it be like some API interfaces or, or whatever. Thank you. Hey, this was very interesting. I have too many questions, so I'm going to try to pick the one. You can grab me afterwards, too, if that's easy. OK, so uh, um, my, my company's platform engineering team is tiny compared to the number of engineers. Um, how, and so we don't have like product management around it. How did you evangelize the IDP within the company? And, and like, is there a PM role associated with platform engineering? Yeah, we, we actually do have product uh, managers embedded in our org. Um, you know, for a long time we only had one, and our, our org is also not that big. I would say it's, you know, 2% of the org is a product, my product at this point. But the company has made an investment that all of our sort of platform initiatives have product associated with them. Um, and because they're embedded, we're not sort of competing for their time. Um, and it's been helpful to sort of have dedicated people that are focused just on dealing with product, like doing product management and figuring out how to do a lot of the stuff that I talked about today. Um, so yeah, we weren't really like, we didn't really have to fight to evangelize it too much because we sort of had people embedded to do that for us. Okay. Someone else? I found that engineers though sometimes are interested in product management, so you could always lean on them to sort of do some of the work too. Okay, I'll wrap up now.